It's a really good question. A ton of different sources, uh, a lot of which are pretty simple to put together. So one, I have just a ton of Google alerts set up for certain keywords. So uh, like music, I have music and tech as a keyword. I have music startups, Spotify for sure, like Google alerts for certain companies. So I'm, I'm always up to tabs every day with the news articles being written about them. Um, I am on Twitter all the time, like maybe a little bit too much, but I get a ton of stories from there, uh, especially so my voice and my style tends to be a lot more about analysis rather than like breaking news or just like straight reporting. And so it's really important for me to include perspectives and to constantly look for perspectives that I might be missing because of whatever blind spots I have from like my immediate experience, right? And, and I find Twitter's really useful for that. So I'll often just pose an open question like, hey, like followers, what do you think about this news that just came out? Um, and people will respond with their differing opinions and only occasionally will I actually quote them as sources, and of course I'll ask for their permission ahead of time and talk with them further, um, not just quote their tweet, but that's just a really useful exercise to get outside of your own bubble, especially if you're writing analyses and seeing how other people are, are thinking about the issue. Um, so Twitter is very important. I, so I have an email newsletter that's um, relatively small, but it's, it's grown to around 3,000 followers, and I've gotten a ton of story ideas just from people who email me um, and especially because, so how I structure my newsletter is it opens usually with a longer essay of mine a, about a specific topic in the music industry. And it's like more long form, it's more free form. And at the end, I always have this call to action saying, um, I'd love to hear what you think about this. Or like, do you have, have you noticed anything interesting happening in music that might be related to this essay? And I get a ton of responses from that that sparks inspiration for you know, further avenues to investigate. So yeah, I would say those are the three main um, sources, so like Twitter, other social media platforms, and engaging regularly, uh, Google Alerts, and setting up things like that to constantly uh, keep, keep the tabs of the news, um, and email newsletters, and anything else where I can just, I guess, get feedback directly from people. Mm. For sure. So yeah, I, I use that phrase, entrepreneurial journalist, uh, which I think applies inherently to every freelancer. I think if you, are, um, if you are leading a sustainable career as a freelancer, you are being entrepreneurial in that you're constantly pitching to uh, publications of your choice and seeking out new opportunities to do business with uh, clients, both old and new. Right? Like that is what any startup founder is doing or any, any entrepreneur is doing. And I also find myself uh, I, I also embrace this term of entrepreneurial journalist in part because I'm trying to be especially proactive in maintaining my relationship, my own relationship with my audience, as opposed to having the publication take care of that in terms of marketing articles to their own audiences. And that definitely requires like a, a ton of work, like in terms of building an infrastructure that allows you to interact with them in a way that doesn't feel overwhelming, um, in a way that's like valuable for both sides. That d definitely requires a ton of work and. So the se second half of your question was just like day to day. Yeah, like what does it look like for your day to day life since you're not like constantly like just going into one building? Right. Yes. So every day for sure is totally different. Um, I do. So as a freelancer, one of the like most cited benefits is that you set your own hours, right? And you're completely flexible. Um, but that's that's a benefit, but it's also like a, a challenge, and it requires a ton of discipline. So I've actually found like I so I don't go into in office, I very often work from home, or I also pay for like a network of co-working spaces in New York City that's like pretty inexpensive. Um, but I but I have to set like strict hours. Like I'm only going to work today from like nine to maybe like five or six. Or if I have to write a little bit in the evening, I'll do that. But before like I, I had this mind of setting your out your your own hours, meaning like only working when you want to <laughs> and like sleeping in until. 12 p.m. or like 1 p.m. or something, which just like completely ruins your workflow. And so just, I guess, having that first step of setting discipline for yourself, um, I think is super useful. I, yeah, I guess in a typical day what I do, so for each article that I write, I try to interview at least three different people. That's kind of like a benchmark I've set for myself, ideally from all different backgrounds. And so I do a ton of interviewing, usually no more than um, like two, like one or two calls a day, but still like on a daily basis. Um, if possible, I try to meet people in person, and New York is a, is a great place to do that because 
It's where a lot of people either live or just visit, you know, for work or otherwise. So I'll very often go just like get a coffee meeting with someone. Um, and that's a good part about freelancing is you can kind of fit your schedule around that in a way that you might not be able to do if you have like a full-time job with a lot of other responsibilities, right? So yeah, coffee meetings with people. I um, do a ton of background research, I guess, for each article I write before I even like start interviewing. So a lot of my day is just done researching and not even writing. I would say probably only uh, like one third of my day, if I'm lucky, is like spent actually like writing, writing. Like a lot of it, a lot of the rest of the day is spent like researching articles, interviewing people, um, managing my newsletter, like my Patreon page, which I have now, that like that definitely requires a lot of work and a lot of like planning ahead of time. So yeah, like a third or like up to one half if I'm lucky or if I've like deliberately set aside time saying, okay, I need to write this piece by this deadline. So yeah, th those are all the different, I guess, pieces of what I have to do as a freelancer and the combination changes day to day. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's um, a good question. So some things that I would encourage. So one is to uh, definitely find a niche and find something like smaller, more specific to focus on. And uh, what I mean by that is, for example, uh, a lot of people want to be like culture writers or like cultural critics. Like that is so broad. Like to, writing about all of culture is um, like a really daunting task and I think if you want to break into this space, what I found really helpful just like focusing on music and tech, for instance, is um, focusing on this one very small niche and like dedicating a ton of time to covering it to the point where publications will want to go to you um, for, for coverage on that topic and saying like, oh, um, she has a great reputation, or he, he or she, they like have a great reputation for um, covering this particular like topic, like we just being becoming the go-to person on a specific angle rather than casting too wide of a net. For sure, ex exploration. I totally value and encourage exploration, but in terms of, um, I guess, yeah, if your goal is to get noticed by a specific editor or a specific publication, I think that's the best approach. Another one is to definitely build a relationship, direct relationship with your audience, um, and I say that because. As, as people have already seen this year, there have been a ton of like layoffs, like full-time layoffs at these bigger publications like BuzzFeed, HuffPo, et cetera, that we're supposed to have like have a solution, right, for digital media. And so I think as a, especially for people who want to freelance, um, having some sort of moat around you for that kind of situation is super important. And I think that best moat is like a reader base who will support you no matter which public, no matter which publication you write for. And there are many ways to do that. One. I personally vouch for email newsletters as the best way to do that. Um, it's kind of ironic that email, which has been around for like several years, is now kind of like I've noticed more and more journalists are starting their own newsletters and like treating that as it's like almost like the new blogging is how I see it. Um, it feels more intimate, and you have like a one-to-one -one relationship with people such that they can write like respond to your newsletter. And you can start a conversation um, immediately one-on-one. -on -one. That's been super helpful for me. Um, yeah, one thing that I would encourage people to try to think about, um, which I talked about a lot earlier today as well, is so the traditional business model of freelancing is, um, is I guess, just getting paid by a publication, like a flat fee to write an article. And I think it's really important that writers think about like how to diversify that revenue down the line. Because I think a lot of freelance writers, when they move to New York, it's like, oh, I just got to keep like, writing these articles. And that's the only way I can make money is so writing these articles. But like, maybe there are other ways to, um, to like, monetize the work that you do. And it did take like, a, uh, a year or so for me to get to this point full time. But like, even things like having a Patreon, where readers have an opportunity to support your work financially, which otherwise there just isn't really, like, you have to take your own initiative and do that. Um, publications won't like, give you that opportunity. So uh, yeah, just thinking about diversifying revenue and diversifying how, how you make your money, I think, is, is really good to think about earlier on, even if you don't implement anything um, when you first start. I think it's super important. Um, yeah, yeah, I think those would be the main things, like building, all that comes to just like building a solid community around the work that you do, regardless of who you ultimately write for, I think.
Yes, for sure. So yeah, so when I uh, when I met this Forbes editor and he was like, uh, I would love to see some samples of your writing. At the time, the only samples that I had were this arts column that I'd written for my college papers, um, which was related to music but not related to business at all. So I was like, oh, is this actually going to work for Forbes? I'm not sure. Um, but the other sample was my own WordPress blog that I just started for free um, a couple months earlier. And it was a blog that I started after this research project I did at Harvard Business School about the intersection of music and tech. And all these ideas were flowing in my head, and I just wanted to get them down somehow. And I like highly, highly recommend that. Uh, you don't need to have a portfolio of pieces published in other outlets to start to build your own just on a blog and just show editors. Especially, I've like heard from a lot of editors that um, like it doesn't have to be completely perfectly edited or copy edited, um, but it's really valuable for editors to get a sense of like your distinct voice um, and what you really bring to the table. And yeah, and th there are tools like WordPress or Wix or any other websites uh, to just start to do that for start to do that for free and like build your own portfolio and essentially have your own platform. And so I found that to be super valuable um, in terms of building my own personal brand, uh, being, I guess, uh, yeah, being as accessible as and as inclusive as possible is really important to me. And kind of as I said before, like Twitter is really important for that. So just like making sure I'm constantly listening to people and actually interacting with them and saying like, oh, what do you think about this piece that just came out rather than uh, what I find to be like a standard or kind of traditional model of completely writing an article behind closed doors and then presenting the article after th the fact and being like, hey, hope you read this. Like, what do you think? But instead, interacting with them throughout every step of the process um, has been really valuable for me. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, that's a very good question. So I think one. Okay, so yeah, the one piece of advice that I would not, it's just not doing, and I haven't done this myself, I'm just passing along, I guess, the being the messenger from other people is, um, so I guess negotiation often comes up in a situation where you're like writing for one, one publication and you get paid like a pretty good rate from them, um, but then you're writing for another publication and you get paid like half the rate, or just like a much, much worse rate. Um, the approach that you give to negotiating should not be like this other publication is paying me this much, so you should pay me this much. Like definitely don't take the comparative approach. Um, the few times I've had to negotiate and has succeeded have just been a matter of um, proving like how much work I would have to do to get this piece um, off the road. So for instance, I wrote about uh, I wrote a piece for Billboard about. Uh, about the midterm elections, last midterm elections, in which people are running for re-election re or election for the first time were the most outspoken advocates for the music industry and for musicians and for issues on like things like intellectual property. And that required a ton of research, like going through all the different records of different Congress people and seeing which you know types of bills they supported. And I was able to make a case for like, I am working more hours for this, and so I um, should get paid more for that. And they were, if you make the case in like a clear way, I think like editors are, are usually pretty open to negotiating that in that sense. Um, yeah, same thing if that if you need to like do a lot of traveling um, or you have yeah like travel accommodation costs that need to be reimbursed. Usually that's built into into the rate. 